Hi, my name is PJ Galati. Welcome to my very first blog. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was actually going to do a blog, but after going to Maker Faire, man, that sun is bright. Now that I got the garage door closed, I can actually see. That's a lot better. My eyes are a little sensitive to light. So this is my first time going to Maker Faire. I really went in there pretty much like a little kid. You know, I didn't know. I, I, I'd seen videos of what to expect. Really didn't know what I was going to see. Before Maker Faire actually started, I went to a pre-event that was uh, sponsored by uh, Matter Hackers and Ultimaker at the Fat Cat Fab Lab on Thursday night. So I came into the city early. I stayed with friends. I went to the event and it was not what I was expecting. I was met at the door by uh, Mara Hittner of, of Matter Hackers, who was uh, super sweet. Signed me up for the raffle for a free 3D printer. And I don't have a 3D printer, so that would have been nice. I don't know if they've given it away yet. While I was in the middle of, of talking to her and signing up, who should walk up right behind me but Evan and Caitlin. And it was like I did a little double take as I saw them coming because I recognized them right away. And I had left a bunch of comments on some recent videos so they knew who I was as soon as I reminded them. Uh, it was very cool. I ended up actually uh, hanging out with them. I would, I would hang out with them, then meet new people, then kind of go back and forth um, you know, we were sort of fast friends uh, right from the start. And once I got inside and started hanging out, the Fat Cat Fab Lab is, you know, it's, it's a workshop area. It's not a very big space. And I think there was uh, over 100 people there. It was, it was very crowded. I know after talking there for several hours the next day, my voice was very harsh. I was literally having to yell to be heard. It was, it was packed full of people. I knew there was going to be a talk there, but the event started at 6, and the talk didn't actually start, I think, until like 8.30 or 9. So the first three hours was basically just talking and getting to know people. It was, it was quite the opposite of most of the other events that I've been to, not necessarily related to makers, but just in general. Very interesting as a change of format. Sort of the highlight of the night for me, and also uh, for, for the entire Maker Faire, was I got to meet Bob Claggett from I Like to Make Stuff and the Making It podcast. I've been making stuff for probably over 30 years. Since I was a kid, I've been making things. But I just started my channel in August of 2017, which is now a little over two months ago. When I decided to start the channel, I switched from making in the garage, in my shop, I switched from listening to music to listening to podcasts because I thought if I was going to get into that mindset of having a channel, it would be good for me to listen to other makers. And so listening to Bob, Jimmy, and Dave, uh, I started at episode number one of Making It and went all the way through uh, from June until July, and it was going, going to YouTube University. Uh, I, I really felt like everything as I was setting up my shop and all the things I was doing it was really like listening to them telling me what to do. Like, you know, any thoughts or questions I might have, they had topics on already. And it was just a very reassuring kind of gentle push into the community of, you know, just get started, just do it. Don't worry so much about what everybody has to say. And that's exactly what I did. I feel a, a, a kinship towards all three of them. And when I found out that Bob was going to be at the Matter Hackers event, I actually found out from him, I made it a point to come early so that I could meet Bob. But I didn't want to just meet him. I wanted to let him know how much I appreciated what he and Jimmy and Dave do. And I knew that his uh, grandfather was a master artisan. He carved all kinds of beautiful things. And one of the things that he loved was fish. So I made it a point to create this HDPE mallet for Bob that uh, I'll put a picture right here. Here's me and Bob together. It is a fishing bobber mallet um, that is uh, in honor of his grandfather. I made it to honor his grandfather, but also to encourage Bob to get out the chisels more and maybe start doing some chisel work in his videos. The mallet looks kind of, you know, on the fancier side as far as it's not the standard block mallet, but I, I impressed upon him that it was fully functional. Soon enough, the video will be out where I actually go through the process of making the mallet. And at the very end, I hammer uh, a masonry nail into a block of wood. These mallets are super dense. Of course, you know, they're not marring, they're not meant to hammer nails, but that's how strong they are. Bob was totally humbled. 
and even more, I think almost more excited than Bob, was his wife, Ginny, who was just a total sweetheart. As, as great as, as Bob is on camera, uh, Ginny is, is just 10 times sweeter. Um, I hung out with her a lot, talking with her a lot at the event. She was actually carrying the mallet around in her purse, and she kept telling me, I feel like I should have it out and be holding it. I don't want to hide it from everybody. So I thought that was super cool. The both of them were just great, great people to, to hang out around. I also got to meet and talk to Alan from Repcord. This was my first time meeting Alan or hearing about him, and Repcord is a, is a, a supplier of 3D printing parts and so forth. The reason that we met is he had this giant 3D printed bow tie that somebody had made him. Here's a picture right here of the two of us. And that caught my eye because I make bow ties. For any of you that do know me, I work full time in the film and television industry. And I have been going to the Cannes Film Festival since 2010. And when you go to the Cannes Film Festival, it's required that you wear a tuxedo for certain events. Black tie is mandatory or they will refuse you entry. So I knew that I was going to be amongst thousands of people that are going to all be dressed exactly the same. The women have a lot of variety in their dresses, but all the guys are going to be in black and white. So I knew right from the beginning I wanted to distinguish myself from everybody else. So every year when I would go to Cannes, I would start making uh, self-tie, not, not the clip-on, self-tying old school bow ties. I started out with satin, but I found it to be too slippery, and then I switched to a very rough silk. Here are two pictures of, of me with the bow ties on, so you can see they're real unique. I've been making them for a, quite a while. It's my own style. It's sort of based off of the 50 style bow ties, but a little bit different. And so when I saw Alan wearing that bow tie, I grabbed him and we started talking. Again, became fast friends. And I saw Alan a couple more times during the, uh, the Maker Fair, so that was very cool. I met Chuck from Film It Friday, who's 3D printing channel. He and I talked for a little bit. And then right after that, I ran into Kaja, who was from Liechtenstein. She 3D prints jewelry and also makes glass beads. I found a real connection with her because once upon a time, I was a custom jeweler for several years. And I still do a little bit of jewelry from time to time. I, I didn't get rid of all my tools. I have a special affinity for jewelers because it's such a small scale to work on and it's it's making in, in the micro level. So her and I hung out and talked quite a bit. On Sunday at the Maker Fair, she ended up doing an interview with me, which I found kind of interesting since my channel is so small. I, I didn't know that it would be of interest to anybody quite yet, as nobody really knows who I am. But I still thought it was sweet of her. I thought it was a nice, short, sweet interview. So walking into Maker Fair, as soon as you get past the initial checkpoint, on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of vendors. And I didn't really want to spend a lot of time going through them on the first day, but there was one that caught my attention. Uh, being an artist myself, I'm always interested when I see art that really kind of is eye-catching or different. And here's a picture right here of what I like to call a machine gun chicken. It was a rooster with an AK-47, something that I thought was really odd. I did stop and talk with the people at the booth. I didn't catch their names. It's a very striking image. I came this close to buying a shirt. But I did go further down and find the merchandise booth for Maker Faire where I got this t-shirt. That, uh, that was another thing that was a little bit of an event for me. Uh, they had this shirt and then they had one in blue. And if you know me, you've seen my logo, I love blue. So I wanted a blue shirt. When I asked for a blue shirt in the men's medium, they said, we don't have that. The blue shirts are youth sizes. I'm young. They still didn't give me one. So I ended up with this shirt, which is still a nice shirt. Maybe next year they'll have blue for adults. You know. First thing that you really see is the heavy metal dragon, which is really just hard to miss. It's right in the way as soon as you're coming down the lane there. Here's what it looked like when it was first getting going. Once I was actually in the center of the area, of course, I had to take a bunch of gratuitous selfie shots. If you follow my Instagram, YouTube channel, or my personal Instagram, 
you'll know that I don't take a lot of selfies. I'm not a big selfie guy. I was excited to be at Maker Faire and I thought, why not? If I didn't like them, nobody had to see. So here's a plethora of the selfies that I took. The next thing I saw was this cool duo with this tuba player that had bubbles blowing out of the tuba and a saxophone player shooting flames out of the sax. I'm sure that this, this, these guys were just having a blast. The music was kind of kooky and funny, and um, the fact that stuff was coming out of the musical instruments in addition to the music was just like uh, super cool. <laughs> Right across from the Heavy Metal Dragon was the Power Racing series. These little kids' cars that they had souped up for under $500 into electric racing cars. another go at it. Your team members should clear that car off immediately. They should come out here and get their car. Do we want to clear it up? We got qualifying Did to do. Did you hit the emergency stop button on that thing? Yeah, make sure you hit the e-stop before you get out of your car. That's kind of advice. After the racing series, I walked over to this Italian maker's pavilion. Uh, I happened to be walking around with a shirt on that said Italia on it because later that night I was going to a pre-wedding barbecue for two friends of mine. One friend in New York was marrying a beautiful young lady from Italy whose name, whose last name is very similar to my name. My name is, is Galati, their last name was Galetti. So somewhere along the lines, I think maybe the families were related. I wore that specifically for her just to, you know, let her know that I was rooting for the home country there. Or I don't know if it's the home country, well, America is the home country, so I don't know. The, uh, the motherland. Or is America the motherland? This is very, very confusing. I just wanted to make her feel good. And her whole family was there from Italy, so that get, got me a warm welcome. At the Italian pavilion, I ran into Fabio Romoli, who showed me this absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous vacuum tube stereo amplifier. He works for a company called Organic. And here's a picture of the amplifier uh, this thing is just so beautiful to me. The way the electronics are laid out, it's like uh, a vehicle engine. Everything was symmetrical, and he even had a black hood that you could throw over it and stick your head under. Uh, in the dark, everything lights up. So as the music is playing, it pulses lights throughout the entire circuit, which was absolutely gorgeous. The picture shows that it's a top and bottom plexiglass setup, but he said that once they were ready for production, Everything would be encased in a crystal case, which I found super classy, and I would love to own one of these. That was one of the two things that I saw at Maker Faire that I really would like to have in my house. Not necessarily in the shop, that was a little bit too fancy for the shop, but that was something that I would love to hook up to a digital record player and just pump out some really old school, beautiful music. My number one favorite thing that I ran into at the fair. Now, let me point out a lot of the stuff that I saw. There was a lot of stuff from makers that were selling things or demonstrating things. Uh, the main pavilion had a, a, a good amount of um, 3D printing, laser cutters, uh, CNC machines, and robots. And all that stuff is super cool, but to me, it was, 
it was cool in the way that they had it there for, for everyone to see. But those things are, number one, way out of the junk hunter price range. In other words, I'm not going to find it on the side of the street. Uh, and number two, I don't really have any use or room currently for those things to be set up. Would it be nice to have? Absolutely. I would love to have any of those things. But I don't even have any place to put it right now. It'd probably have to go on the ceiling. So the one thing that I did find that I thought was just absolutely, I, I'm ordering one, it's super cool, is a company called Number All. They had this cool tool called the Deluxe Letter Punch Set. Here's a picture right here. It's a punch set with a wheel, a cammed wheel that has the numbers and letters you need for stamping metal in a box, in, in a nice wood box, and it's just three of them instead of these individual punches where you always lose one and then the set is ruined. I found this to be really fascinating and when I stopped to talk to the guys they told me that it had been around since the 1930s. I told them they needed a lot of press because this was way cooler than any of the punch sets I've seen before and if this is from the 30s everybody should have one of these in my opinion. The other thing that they said they would do is I asked can I get this punch set in the font of my logo and I showed him my logo and this is bank gothic I think is the the lettering that I use and they said absolutely we do custom fonts so that's on my list they will be getting a phone call from me because I don't have a set of punches and I think this stuff is super cool one of the other things I saw which was kind of interesting was lumen solar powered jewelry this stuff was had kind of a a cutesy design to it and i like the fact that it was solar powered and had the little blinking leds it was something that i myself have thought of doing years ago when i was a jeweler and so seeing somebody doing it now uh, had sort of a personal connection to me I, i'm glad that it's finally kind of getting out there and that i wasn't the only one that had that idea i saw everybody walking around with these little maker robot pins and I said, where can I get one of these? And they said, you've got to go to the Learn to Solder tent. Now, I've been soldering for over 30 years, so I definitely didn't need to learn how to solder, but I had to have a little glowy-eyed LED robot. That was not negotiable. While I was outside in the hot sun waiting to get in there and get one of these little guys, this gorgeous mermaid rolled up, and uh, she was just uh, really, really sweet. I asked if I could take her picture and she said absolutely. So here she is. One of the coolest costumes I saw the entire time I was there. And she looked like she was just having a blast. I think that her husband was pushing her around and the two of them were just very sweet. Once I went in the New York Science Center building to kind of cool off in the air conditioning. I found this really neat exhibit of this field of wheat and uh, I didn't read up on it or anything I heard other people talking about it but it was really sort of calming it have felt like a, almost like a Zen garden indoors with these individual stalks of wheat kind of going back and forth it was something very peaceful about it and I, I stood there for quite a while just sort of getting the feeling of this um, this this swaying motion about this time, I knew that Bob was going to be talking on the YouTube panel up at the main stage, so I headed up there. On my way up there, I ran into Paul Jackman, who everybody knows. Grabbed a sticker from him, gave him one of my stickers. One of the things I did before I left for Maker Faire was make this sign. The I'm a Maker sign made out of pretty much all the materials that I build with. So I thought this would be a good way to get attention and to let people know exactly who I am and talk about my channel. It's, it's a conversation starter and it worked. I had a lot of different people 
stop and talk to me about the sign, including two women from India, from, uh, from New Delhi, that were gonna set up a maker space. We talked and I actually told them about some things in the main pavilion I saw that would be good for them to teach kids about electronics and so on. In addition to meeting Paul Jackman, I met Rody Jeff and LePic Boy, very cool guys. Uh, I'm subscribed to both their channels. We all piled in for the YouTube channel. Everything was being moderated by Caleb Craft. It was Bob Claggett, Becky Stern, John Park, Angus from Australia, and Joel Telling. So it was a lot of 3D printing up there on the board, but all of them were, you know, YouTubers. The panel was really cool. I thought everybody's responses to the questions were very pertinent, but there was a lot of funny moments too. You know, there's a, I think that's kind of inherent when you're dealing with anybody that's on YouTube. There's always an element of comedy thrown in there somewhere. After the YouTube panel, I went back out into the main area outdoors, and as I was looking around, I saw this band just roaming around playing funky music. They're called Funk Rust. There was this guy that was a one-man band called Unigen, and he had this sort of, like, I don't know, it was kind of like a rave setup where it was just, he was, he was singing this song. I'll just let you listen to it. I thought it was really cool that he was walking around performing for everyone. After this was all done, I went to the barbecue for my friend's wedding, and then from there, I went to the Park Hotel in Queens for the Inventables Matter Hackers rooftop party, and I got to hang out again with Bob and Ginny. I also got to hang out with Evan and Caitlin again, and there was a bunch of other people that were there. It was just a very cool night. It was super packed out there, just like it was at the, at the pre-event on Thursday night but it was, a, it was a lot less people just because the space was literally just, it was, it was crunched. I rode up in the elevator with John Park and as the two of us got out, somebody was leaving and warned us, listen, it's a fire hazard in there. And literally as soon as we got out of the door, uh, there were flames shooting from somewhere on the bar. I guess it was some kind of flaming drink. We didn't quite see it, but we saw the reflection of the flames. We ended up outside. The rooftop party opened up into like a little thin, not really a veranda, but we got to hang out outside and talk and just chill. All good things. At the rooftop party, Bob mentioned the R2-D2 builders, which I had not seen. And I, I asked him where I could find these guys, and he said, well, they're kind of around the way. And so on Sunday, I went looking for them, and I looked everywhere. And let me tell you something, they were not easy to find. You had to practically go all the way out like you're going to exit the Maker Fair, and then just before the exit, make a quick right. And they were literally off by themselves, almost like they'd lost a bet with someone, and they were put in this really weird area, sort of up on a little hill. But these things were super cool. I really liked the, the R2-D2s. There was one that made all kinds of sounds, 
and then there was another one that was that was an imperial droid and then the pink one right next to it arm opened up and like a little computer interface came out and then it would shoot out gas like it had been shot by uh, a blaster they, and they look totally movie quality super awesome the detail was spectacular <laughs> Way hotter on Sunday than it was Saturday, so I ended up going back into the New York Science Center. And while I was in there, I ran into Paul Jackman and his wife Kristen, who, who uh, I got to hang out with for, I don't know, maybe about 30, 40 minutes. Here's a picture of me and Paul. We're both goofballs. His wife Kristen is in the military. She's in the, I believe, in the Coast Guard. Paul's a lot taller than her, but I think between the two of them, she's the badass, let me tell you. Paul was nice enough to give me a Carolina shirt. He was walking around doing some, some promotions for Carolina shoes. I'm not familiar with Carolina, but I, I really appreciate the shirt. He's a very cool guy to hang out with, very humble. After hanging out with Paul, I went back outside. I ran into Bernie Solo from Works by Solo, who I'd seen at the event at the Park Hotel Saturday night. He was talking to Bob, but he was on the other side of me. So he, I saw him, but I don't think he saw me because it was just so packed in such a narrow space. So I went up to him and started talking. I met him and his brother, Carl, both very cool guys. We ended up walking around and chilling out for quite some time. Interesting things I saw while walking around on Sunday were this gigantic mechanized ant that looked like it was it belonged in some kind of a movie, chasing somebody down for some nefarious reason, maybe to build a nest out of them, I don't know. I went inside and saw this very cool exhibit on the second floor, all cobalt blue glass room that was several stories high. Cobalt blue is my favorite color. This exhibit was a 3D interactive surround, uh, had all kinds of animals and water, and you go and you use hand motions and everything would interact with you. And I thought that that was a really cool, something I hadn't seen up close and personal before. I really thought that it was a neat setup to have. I ended up leaving Monday to come back into New Jersey. I had left my truck parked at my father's house and taken the train into the city because it's just such a hassle to park in the city. And as I was going back to my father's house, I passed at least three or four different houses, dumpsters out front, all being remodeled, all full of wood. And then literally right around the corner from my father's house, his friend Joe was remodeling his porch. And after Maker Fair, I stopped by my dad's house and his neighbor was redoing his porch and he had a dumpster full of wood, pulled a ton of plywood out of there, uh, one piece, two pieces, three quarter inch, mostly half inch, a um, whole bunch of two by fours, cut to about 12 inches, and then I got these two massive pieces of, uh, I don't know what they are, I can't really tell from looking at them but um, they're heavy, they're very heavy. In addition to getting wood from Joe, my father had gotten this, Duracraft benchtop bandsaw. Apparently some friend of his didn't want it, gave it to him. He tried to get it working and got frustrated. He didn't want it, now I've got it. So in the future, this will probably be a video where we try to get it working. If it does not work, most likely it's going to become parts for something else. But that's kind of a ways in the future. I still have a lot of things that I need to get done before I have enough time to play with this. Here are some of the stickers and swag that I got while I was at Maker Fair. I forgot to mention that I got this cool ruler from DigiKey that looks like a circuit board. And then all these stickers with this blue dog from Tindy, which is a website that is sort of like Etsy, but for selling electronics. I thought that that was really cool. Right now I have all of these stickers and I have nowhere in the shop to put them. So I don't know where they're going to wind up because I have no wall space, but eventually they will find a home somewhere. <laughs> 